This is CBC Here and Now. They were all yelling low, everybody down, everybody down. But uh, they were so calm and they were good and the landing was amazing. All teams were on site. Uh, but of course, uh, many things grow, go through your mind. The crash landing in Stephenville. And a big fright for the passengers from Labrador. The airport goes into emergency mode as the PAL airplane skids to a stop. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. And we start in Stephenville, where a PAL Airlines flight had a crash landing. The flight had been headed to Deer Lake, but was diverted because of trouble with the landing gear. We've had 47 passengers from Labrador and four crew members aboard. Here now is Colleen Connors reports from the airport. Well, it's quite hard to see, but that PAL-8 is right behind me in the middle of the runway here at the Stephenville Airport. And if you look closely, you can see that it is nose down on the pavement. It's hard to see any other damage really from this far away. Just moments ago, all of those passengers that were once on board that plane, well, with big smiles on their faces, they boarded a charter bus on its way to Deer Lake. Some looking quite tired, all their luggage in tow, but certainly some smiles on their faces as they got to leave this ordeal today. And when speaking with some of these passengers, they described the scene as surreal, even calm at times. Have a listen to what one of them had to say. The flight attendants and the pilot were amazing. Was it scary at all? What was it like it when it landed? Scary when they were all yelling low, everybody down, everybody down. But uh, they were so calm and they were good and the landing was amazing. We got here, the crew, Excellent. Uh, everybody in Stephenville was really good. Volunteers with the Red Cross were also on scene here at the airport all afternoon, giving out free pizza and water to the passengers as they waited for things to clue up. And of course, they are on their way home now this later this afternoon. The next step, of course, is to get this plane off the middle of the runway so that this airport and this runway can open again to other air traffic. Now, hopefully that will happen later this evening in the next coming hours. And the manager of the airport explains what needs to happen here to make that happen here at this airport. The proper authorities to do an analysis of what exactly has happened uh, will be on site, uh, I understand, two, by two o'clock tomorrow morning. We want to open our operations as soon as possible such that we are available in the event of another emergency or should some other aircraft or airline need to use us as an alternate. Once officials arrive, there is plans that this plane will leave the runway and this place can open once again to the public. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Stephenville. Well, snow is the big story in many parts of Newfoundland today. Shovels, snow blowers, and plows digging out from all of that snow that fell. Much of the area remained under a winter storm warning for much of the day. There were some power outages as well. But here on the Avalon, the wind is the big story. The storm is being called the most intense storm on the planet, and it's hitting our province. Here now's Jeremy Eaton is uh, live out in the wind tonight. Jeremy? Well, the wind has died down a little bit, but it's been windy for the last uh, 24 hours or so. You can see uh, this boat here uh, on the harbor in downtown St. John's is still bouncing around a little bit in the waves, but that's not the case as it was yesterday and more importantly, last night and today. Many people lost sleep last night due to all the wind. And more importantly, when many people woke up this morning, they lost a lot more than that. They lost some garbage nets, trees were down, fences, and uh, basically anything that wasn't nailed down. One of the major streets in the city was shut down for most of the morning as parts of the nearby science building blew into the road. Traffic had to be rerouted through the university. Newfoundland Power had its own problems. More than 10,000 customers all over the island lost power due to the windstorm. In the east end of St. John's, swaying power lines had to be stabilized. Some replaced. In the ghouls, the roof of the local arena didn't stand much of a chance to the wind. Due to the damage and the debris blowing around the parking lot, the entire area had to be shut down. Everything at the ghouls Lions Arena was cancelled for the day. At Signal Hill, no signs of hikers or sightseers. Just white-capped waves and a lot of wind. 
At Cape Spear, a few brave souls went towards the water to get a closer look. Waves battered and bashed against the rock. An impressive yet scary sight. Here's some weather karma for you. I, start, I said at the start of this piece that it wasn't that windy and the wind picked up and it's freezing cold down here. Now, I, I know people don't care about my personal life, but uh, I did lose my fence or part of my fence uh, overnight and, and in today. That's how windy it was. But that's what I saw today out on the streets. Uh, Ashley probably knows a lot more about meteorology. I know she knows a lot more about meteorology. And uh, she can say, uh, Ashley, what was your take on uh, this windy weather that we've had? Well, you mentioned people uh, losing a lot of sleep last night. I was certainly one of those people uh, trying to get used to the winds, uh, especially shaking my house into the uh, overnight. Even this morning, I tried to take a nap. That didn't work out very well. Uh, but if we take a look at the current wind, or rather what we saw as far as wind gusts go to, uh, today and even in the past 24 to 36 hours, the strongest winds were reported for Green Island at 159 kilometers per hour. Any exposed area saw gusts uh, close to that. Uh, Bonavista at 133 kilometers per hour up through uh, Cape Bonavista, that was uh, 150. And then a number of areas uh, up through even Mary's Harbor, 107 kilometers per hour here in St. John's reached uh, between 115. There was 120 recorded as well, uh, but we are going to see these winds eventually ease as we head through the night tonight. The warnings are starting to drop off as that happens as well. Uh, it does look like the next system moves in on Friday night into Saturday with some snow on the way, but I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. Now, to give you some perspective on what today's storm has been like that Ashley was talking about in some places, you're looking there at a beautiful, calm postcard picture scene in Avondale before the wind picked up. So check this out. This is what it looked like after the weather changed. The wharves, a small boat, and even a portion of the road underwater there. So you can see the contrast wharf way down. Wow. And uh, Water. that's the before and after. What a mess. It's easy with snow around. I don't like snow. <laughs> no, it's not bad. It's not cold or anything. No, if it's going to be winter, may as well have snow. An early winter in central Newfoundland. In 10 minutes, we'll look at whether people are celebrating the snow or wishing for summer back. Those big, strong winds whipped up some enormous waves in Placentia Bay. Those waves reached 15 meters. That's about 50 feet high. A Norwegian aquaculture giant Grieg plans to put 11 of these sea cage sites in the bay to produce about 33,000 tons of salmon per year. Now, critics say they doubt those cages could handle the heavy pounding and they warn of massive escapes of thousands of fish. Well, Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne says the company's technology can withstand the worst. Those, those wave heights would not be experienced in the locations where the aquaculture sites are found. And secondly, the actual cages themselves have been designed and have been tested and proven to be uh, able to withstand wave heights of up to 60 uh, feet. A decision by the province's largest school district is causing some parents to worry about their kids' safety. The English school district has a new policy where they'll stop using coach buses on trips less than two hours. As Ryan Cook reports, even a national safety group is weighing in with concerns. For starters, school buses are just not designed to be used on highways. Lewis Smith is the national director with the Canada Safety Council. He's worried about dangers kids could be exposed to if they encounter this on a highway. The high back seats and compartmentalization of a school bus are little help in a highway crash where rollovers are far more common. Kelly Hoolan Taylor and Susan Keating have been doing their homework. Both are parents of busy kids at Corner Book Regional High. Since the Humboldt Broncos crash last spring, the parents say it hasn't been easy to send their kids off for trips. Let's face it, since April last year, Every time your kid goes on a bus, motor coach or whatever, you haven't really felt safe. Uh, but knowing that this year we moved to one with, with seatbelts, um, I finally felt a little bit safer. The Cornerbrook High School team has been buckling up for the Broncos, a social media project. Then last week, the board implemented its new policy and the team had to take two school buses instead. The parents complained and they say exceptions were made for them by the school district. 
We've reached out to the district numerous times over the past two days for an interview on this story, but they declined. Instead, they sent us an emailed statement. They say trips longer than two hours can use a coach bus. So can trips taking large amounts of gear, like a hockey team or a school band. But the exceptions don't apply to groups below 7th grade. Doesn't make a lot of sense to Lewis Smith. When we're talking about buses, it's, they're still a very safe method of transportation overall. But in this case, it's about using the right tool for the right job. And there's no denying that a coach bus is much more effective at keeping children safe on highways than school buses are. The exceptions mean it's back to coach buses for their kids on hockey trips. But these parents still don't understand the rationale in the first place. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. A Royal Newfoundland Constabulary officer is headed to the top court in the country to try to stop his high-profile sexual assault case from going back to trial. Here now's Jen White has been looking into the story and joins us now live. So Jen, bring us up to speed. Well, Constable Carl Douglas Snellgrove was found not guilty of that charge last year, sparking controversy in a case that largely revolved around the issue of consent. About four years ago, a woman in her early 20s was having trouble finding a cab at 2.30 in the morning. She told the court she was too drunk to stay at a bar in St. John's. Snellgrove testified that while on duty, the woman approached his marked police car and asked for a ride. He says she initiated sexual activity at her apartment and that it was consensual. But the woman said she couldn't remember much of what happened after she let Snellgrove in, that she was too intoxicated to stand up. A jury found Snellgrove not guilty of sexual assault. That verdict triggered public protests and the Crown appealed. Last month, the province's Court of Appeal found that the trial judge had made mistakes in her instructions to the jury, specifically about a section of the criminal code that deals with the meaning of consent. So a new trial was ordered. But two weeks ago, Snellgrove filed a notice of appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada to stop that new trial from happening. Snellgrove's lawyer, Randy Piercy, as well as public prosecutions, have declined to comment at this time. Meanwhile, the RNC says Snellgrove is currently suspended without pay. Anthony. Thanks, Janice. Jen White live in our newsroom. A Clarenville institution might have seen its last days. Bury's shipyard has been deemed bankrupt. The company missed a court deadline in October, effectively giving up the effort to try to stand on its own. Creditors met in St. John's yesterday to plot out the future. The company owes almost $5 million, a big debt, and it couldn't secure a sale since it started proceedings under the Bankruptcy Act this year. During busy times, more than 100 people worked at that shipyard. DFO scientists say fewer snow crab are growing to commercially, commercially viable size and continuing to fish at high levels could cause long-term problems for the stock. So here's what's happening. The fishery only targets large males like the light-colored one you see right here. But snow crab stop growing when there are no larger competitors. And virtually all of that competition has been removed by the ecosystem by the fishery. The good news, researchers believe the trend can be reversed. We have a precedent from the south coast where you asked earlier if there's any area that's not seeing this. They had seen this a few years back uh, and it seems like it's gone the other way and size at maturity is increasing again. So uh, this gets into the world of genetics where something is a phenotypic or a plastic trait versus a genotypic or a permanent trait. Uh, so we're hopeful right now that this is not genetic uh, this is not uh, irreversible harm or anything been done at this point, that these things can again uh, grow large and hopefully quite quickly if we're able to reestablish uh, a healthy population of big crabs. Well, no one was injured when fire heavily damaged a shed and a nearby house in Bonavista today. It happened on the Cape Shore Road. Emergency crews were called around 2 o'clock this afternoon. The RCMP says the fire started in the shed and then the high winds blew the flames toward the neighbor's house, lighting that on fire. Someone was able to call the people inside the house to get them out before that fire spread. And three people lost their home after a fire yesterday in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. The Red Cross is helping with emergency shelter, food and clothing purchases. All three residents of the home are adults. The fire started around lunchtime yesterday. Firefighters had trouble knocking it down because of the high winds. The Red Cross says the two-story house was older and was extensively damaged.
Well, back to the politics of pot. There's still no answer on Canopy, and the numbered company that owns the land that its weed facility is being built on. Certainly, uh, you know, we'll endeavour to find out if, if that's what the member wishes. Now, two weeks ago today, Finance Minister Tom Osborne told the House of Assembly that he tried to figure it out, but today he said he wasn't able to do that, and he says he only has access to the publicly available information and he can't dig further because of privacy regulations. The Progressive Conservatives think that more can be done to find out who's behind the company and suspect that a Liberal friend owns and is profiting from the land. I honestly don't know who owns the land. I can tell you that wholeheartedly. I don't know who owns the land. I endeavoured to find out there's a director listed and that is all I'm allowed to have access to. There's a lot of public suspicion about the identities of the people behind the numbered company and these questions deserve an answer. The minister should find out and he can find out as far as we can tell by asking the Minister of Health for the country. I guess uh, last night with the high winds and everything, the uh, snow blew right in and stuck right to the living room window. Winter settles in over Central. Coming up, we go to the snowy streets of Gander. Another update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. A 
amazed, uh, Ash, that you found time to iron your hair during the commercial <laughs> break after being out there. I'm getting good at this. Yes, you are. <laughs> Fast. Yeah. Well, uh, you can't talk about the, all of this wind without considering the waves. So take a look at this. Here again is the scene on or in the Avalon this afternoon. The wharf is barely in sight there. Yeah, that's uh, in Avondale. That's amazing. This afternoon. Yeah. yeah. And we move off to Bonavista. That's uh, pretty wild weather there, and that's within a somewhat sheltered harbor. So just imagine what it's like out in the open. Yeah, and here's a, a boat uh, submerged below water in uh, Bonavista last night under those uh, relentless waves and as Jeremy mentioned a bit earlier, severe winds and stormy weather knocked out power in about 10,000 homes across the province today. And uh, Newfoundland Power said broken trees were hitting power lines all day, making it difficult to complete repairs. Here's what happened on the lawn of Weekend AM host Heather Barrett oh, no. here on the Avalon. All right, well, at least she could just sort of maybe decorate that in a few weeks, bring it inside the house. <laughs> If you want a sad looking Charlie Brown kind of tree. Oh, she's got the upper part hey, there. Hey, that'll totally work. That's nice, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice Christmas tree. You've got to make something good of that. That's uh, right. <laughs> the lower half, not so much. Oh. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people were uh, cleaning up some damage around their no homes doubt. and stuff today. Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, temperatures were also the story today. Uh, chilly, especially with uh, the winds. Look, taking a look at some of the numbers. Minus one here in St. John's. We've got similar temperatures across the board. Minus four in St. Anthony. And then Labrador City sitting at minus 12. Factor in that wind chill. It's feeling closer to minus 17 in Lab City. That will continue to drop as we head through the overnight tonight. We're looking at wind chills feeling closer to minus 25. And then uh, a number of wind chills between minus 9 and uh, minus 12 across the island. So we do still have a couple of wind warnings in place, mainly for Bonavista North and Bonavista. Those will eventually start to uh, end as we head into the next couple of hours, or rather uh, towards the early morning hours, because we're gonna, still going to see some pretty gusty winds in the next couple of hours and then heading towards three in the morning or at least mid uh, mid evening midnight rather uh, we're going to see those winds really ease back down to uh, 30 gusting 50 for the most part and then into tomorrow uh, we'll see them die right down into the afternoon out ahead of another system that's going to move in and then the winds will pick up again so here's a look at the forecast for tonight happy valley goose bay going down to minus 15 tonight minus 17 in lab city but those winds will ease into the overnight still looking at some blowing snow though for parts of central and along the west coast minus six in corner brook eventually uh, going to see this chance of flurry taper off towards the early morning hours and then the sun should peak out tomorrow as a ridge of high pressure moves in but then into the evening we're going to see the next system move in temperatures generally where we're sitting today so between minus one minus two a little bit cooler up through uh, parts of Labrador where we could see about five centimeters of snow towards the evening hour so let's time out that precipitation uh, we'll start to see that cloud cover move in through the day tomorrow starting in the southwest that's when we'll start to see that snow move in and we'll continue to spread across the island through the day and into the evening and overnight hours uh, parts of the Buren and Avalon will change over to rain so accumulations uh, won't be too bad for portions of the southern parts of the island but uh, already just starting to see these warnings end and more have been um, more have been issued, especially uh, weather st special weather statement in effect right now. So here's a look at uh, what the models are pointing out right now. This will likely change tomorrow, but this is just an early, uh, early estimate of what's going to happen. So somewhere between 15 to 20 centimeters is possible. Uh, Northern Peninsula missing most of the snowfall, so we could see probably closer to five centimeters of snow. Eastern portions between 10 to 15, and the Avalon looking at about five to 10 centimeters. Again, that will change over to rain into uh, through the overnight and into Saturday as those temperatures will continue to jump up as well. Uh, but the winds will pick up yet again on Saturday. We're going to see uh, some gusty winds down through the southern half of the island and then uh, continue to increase as we head towards the day on Saturday. Eventually, the winds will ease on Sunday with a little bit of relief, but I'll have all of those details coming up in a little bit. All right, so as uh, <laughs> Ashley rejoins us here, um, 
A little known fact, uh, Jeremy Eaton had the worst Mary Poppins uh, <laughs> job audition ever today, <laughs> breaking a very good CBC umbrella. And you can check that out, just know how windy it is. Uh, go to Jeremy's uh, Twitter handle on Twitter and you can check it out. <laughs> Down a second, right? <laughs> yeah, and we had a bit of fun today, too. We did. Uh, Ashley and I thought we would conduct a few wind experiments of our own. Yeah, and we didn't even break an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Have a look. <laughs> You have your uh, little gadget there that you used last night to try to measure the winds. Trusty anemometer. Mm-hmm. Well, we have a few other little tools to try this time. All right, let's see how it works. Let's go. <laughs> we have lots of things in here to try. Uh, what do you want to start with? Bubbles. Bubbles. Let's try bubbles. Oh, it's actually working. Is it? Just let the wind do the work. Badminton. Badminton, all it's right. It's not gonna work. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bubbles were good. Badminton was a bust. Now for the ultimate wind activity. I'm just holding it in. Man down! Okay, apparently I don't know how to fly a kite. It's amazing. I leave for 20 minutes and see what you guys do. Was there anything left for that kite by the end of it? Not mine. Oh, slow mo. Oh, That's good. For the effect. Were you holding on to that, Carolyn? <laughs> I was. Yeah. Hers worked, mine didn't yeah. work. I couldn't even get it off the ground. But that's okay. It yeah. was fun. <laughs> yeah, fun we had wind. some fun out there. Yeah, we definitely did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in Central, it wasn't the wind, but the snow that got under the skin of Gander residents today. A winter storm that closed schools and courts. Li uh, reporter Garrett Berry is live with us tonight. Garrett, what is it like out there? Well, right now, maybe if you weren't in the holiday mood already, this scene right here might help you. This is the Gander's Town Hall. Some softly falling snow, a little bit of wind, but very romantic here tonight. And in fact, while I was setting up my presentation here tonight and setting up my camera, there were two young children and their caregiver and their dog walking by right behind me and playing with the snow and calling out to their mom. It was very, very lovely. At least it was to me. I'm a softie. What can I say? One thing, though, that probably people don't like is the cleanup. The worst of this storm hit overnight, so by the time most of us here in Gander woke up, there was quite a job on our hands. Gas up those snowblowers and get the scrapers out. I make sure everything is nice and clean before I move the car. Right, and also on your house windows out there, I saw. Well, I guess uh, last night with the high winds and everything, the uh, snow blew right in and stuck right to the living room window. So. I kind of scraped it off so I can see out. <laughs> this feels familiar, but even after 70 years, it's no easier. Yes, but if, uh, if the government would uh, pay us enough money, maybe uh, in, our, uh, in our golden years, as they call it, we might be able to, to afford to go some places where it's warmer. Some worked, others played. Uh, I think I had an assignment today to be passed in, but I haven't got to do it yet, so. <laughs> but really, it's for the best. I brought it up here to try to break in some trails for everyone else, so they haven't got to get their feet wet. So this is really a humanitarian act on your behalf. Yeah, I'm trying to help everyone out. Love it or hate it. He likes to jump in it. It's clear. Winter is back. Oh, it was horrendous, wasn't it? My, my barbecue almost blew off the patio. <laughs> I had to go out like 2 o'clock in the morning to secure it. <laughs> oh, I'll say we'll have this sometime in June. Well, we mentioned Jeremy Eaton's Twitter account earlier in the show, and of course, there are lots of weather watchers in central Newfoundland on Twitter. One account that I found today, I believe, Gander Weather Records, it posted that between yesterday and today, there's about 20 centimeters of snow fell in some areas of town, and that total makes it the most since May 24th of this year. Just a reminder of how much time we have left with all this. Reporting live for here now, I'm Garrett Berry in Gander. So you actually get to ski home if you want. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm not fresh, I'm not fresh for a skier, but uh, maybe some snowshoes would be good uh, good this time. You know, I, I got a plan ahead. Uh, maybe, maybe I can uh, you know I can ask for some um, you know professional allowance for something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. Listen, we'll uh, we'll see you, Gary. Thank you very much. It looks like Christmas. It does. Imagine I, if we had all that snow yeah. in St. John's I, with all of that wind. You know, it I'm ready. Bad. I'm ready for winter. I look at a scene like that. You're not a big snow person, right? Not really. Not really. Bees don't like snow. <laughs> uh, but you know, I All bring it. It's time to go skiing. Time to go snowshoeing. I hear you. I hear right? you. My dogs Christmas. like the snow. Christmas. Okay, so. good. Thanks. My roots in Jamaica and my love of the Blue Mountains of Jamaica have drawn me back there many times. Angela Baker was born and raised in Jamaica. Now calls Cornerbrook home, and she'll tell us about the connection she sees between that warm island and this one.
the Muskrat Falls inquiry today. Suggestions the province's top bureaucrat was biased towards sanctioning the hydroelectric project. The lawyer for the Coalition of Concerned Citizens is suggesting what Robert Thompson wrote and said in the years before sanction show he had made up his mind long before the project was given the green light. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. The clerk of the executive council is expected to stay on top of government priorities. But lawyer Jeff Budden suggested Robert Thompson went too far when he became an advocate for one of them. During a public panel discussion at the Harris Centre in 2011, Thompson responded to a Muskrat Falls critic and defended the project. Was it appropriate for the clerk of the executive council to be arguing in favour of the Muskrat Falls development while it was still a matter of uh, public debate uh, in this period before sanction? Uh, it would have been a fair uh, thing for me to do, possessing information about the policy of the government, to also talk about that. Budden also asked about an email Thompson wrote to then Premier Kathy Dunderdale in the spring of 2012, suggesting messages she may want to give to the Nelcor board, including this one, won't be deterred on Muskrat Falls by detractors pursuing narrow and petty agendas. Later in his testimony, Thompson addressed the suggestion that he had an inappropriate bias in favour of the project. The government uh, was clearly a proponent in moving forward with the project uh, for all good reasons and needed to be aggressive in pushing that, uh, that policy goal that, and for all the benefits I've described earlier forward. But at the same time, being cautious and critical and, uh, and self-reflective about whether it was going to succeed, whether it was viable, whether in the end, as we focused on muskrat and infeed, whether it was the least cost for the ratepayer. Thompson ended his testimony this afternoon. Richard Westney of the Westney Consulting Group is due on the stand tomorrow. He was part of a team that took a hard look at the risks of developing this almost $13 billion project. Mark Quinn, CBC News. St. John's. Former New Brunswick Premier Brian Gallant is stepping down as leader of the provincial Liberals. His party formed a minority government after this fall's election, but it fell two weeks ago in a confidence vote on the Liberals' throne speech. It has been an absolute honour to, to have had the chance to serve as Premier and leader of the Liberal Party of New Brunswick. We were not a perfect government, but I believe we were a good government. I'm proud to say that I'm leaving the province in a better state than when I became Premier. Glant became the leader of New Brunswick's Liberal Party in 2012 and became Premier in 2014. He says he'll stay on as leader until the party chooses a new one. Well, artists thrive on inspiration, and our next story is about an artist from Jamaica who fell in love with Newfoundland's south coast, especially its mountains. For years, Angela Baker used her paints to capture the beauty of places like Francois and Rencontre West, and recently she left the colder climes of Newfoundland to rediscover the warmer, mountainous landscapes of her youth where she was born, Jamaica. I'm Angela Baker. I'm a visual artist, born and raised in Jamaica, and settled in Newfoundland in 1976. When I'm working on a painting, I'm really trying to return to and recapture the emotions that I felt in that particular location. One of the most recent paintings that I completed had the dawn light in the early morning coming over the mountain, but it made a, a banana leaf look absolutely translucent green. And, um, that was really an awesome experience when I went back and saw that. My roots in Jamaica and my love of the Blue Mountains of Jamaica have drawn me back there many times. That visceral connection, it has a lot to do with childhood nostalgia and growing up in the foothills of the Blue Mountains. I think that's why I connected so well with the ruggedness of Newfoundland and did a very large series of works on the south coast of Newfoundland. Funnily enough, there is a certain similarity in the colors between the mountains of Newfoundland and of Jamaica. 
particularly when you're dealing with distances and things become very um, far away and pale blues. The colors were very much like the colors in this painting here. One of the connections and reasons why I did the South Coast series here in Newfoundland was that when I learned about resettlement, talked to the people who used to live in now abandoned communities, the whole experience of dislocation, of leaving the, your birthplace, the place where you belong, um, that really enabled me to connect and relate to the people that I met on the South Coast. I've been up every single fjord except two between Birdview and Hermitage. The people took me in boats and all they wanted was money for gas. So that was a great adventure. So now I'm kind of doing what many of them did there, revisiting the abandoned communities. I am now going back to Jamaica. And I think it has something to do with, well, it definitely has something to do with getting older. Now I'm in my 70s and I'm pushing 80. Um, I just feel the need to go back to what made me who I am. Pretty good stuff, huh? Beautiful. Yeah, Love yeah. the accent, too. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's amazing. Imagine being, you know, you get to live in Newfoundland in the summers, and then mm -hmm. now as you get older, as she is going to, I think I'll go back to Jamaica during the winters and paint a little bit. Oh, Lovely nice. woman. I yeah. wonder what she thinks about Screech, Jamaican uh, rum. Oh, that's true. She's probably an aficionado. Another connection? Yeah, I'll tell you during the commercial. <laughs> some stories we can't share. <laughs> Well, as we begin to gear up for the Christmas season, Nova Scotia has started its annual tradition, sending a Christmas tree to Boston. Nova Scotia has been doing this for 47 years now as a thank you for the help from Boston during the Halifax explosion in 1917 that leveled that city. The tree will make the journey on this truck that you see there uh, from Boston uh, where it'll be put on display.
they left the city and created a homestead. Steve and Lisa McBride, the homesteaders. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now. Ottawa has come up with nearly $90 million to conduct repairs, renovations and replacement of police facilities in First Nations and Inuit communities. The funding will be spread over seven years. It's in addition to nearly $300 million over five years announced last January and earmarked for more officers, salaries and equipment. Many of the communities served by Indigenous forces are remote or fly-in. The upgrade program is intended to be cost-shared with the provinces and territories. Ottawa says the First Nations policing program serves about 450 communities. Indigenous police forces have complained for years of chronic underfunding. Well, next week, a judge in Brockville, Ontario, will make a ruling in a sexual assault case with a very rare defense, sex somnia. 38-year-old Ryan Hartman has admitted to the crime, but he says he was in a deep sleep when it happened. The CBC's Judy Trin has this story, but first a warning. There are some details which you may find disturbing. Oh, he's guilty, and he does not have sex somnia. The 30-year-old woman was raped in 2011 at a house party near Brockville, Ontario. After a night of drinking, she fell asleep with her arms wrapped around her boyfriend on an air mattress. She woke up a few hours later with her jeans pulled down and a sharp pain in her buttocks. A stranger was on the other side of her. I, sh I was just in shock. I, I was, what is happening? Uh, I put my hand behind me and when I felt it was some, someone was there, um, he withdrew immediately from my body. Ryan Hartman was convicted of sexually assaulting her, but he won a new trial after bringing forward evidence of sleepwalking. At his second trial, his defense argued he was in a deep sleep when he attacked her and not criminally responsible. It's now up to a judge to decide if Hartman deserves jail or if he needs psychiatric treatment. University of Ottawa professor Blair Crew says sleep orders are difficult to prove. Most of the people that rely on this defense can demonstrate a history of sleepwalking before. Often there's a family history. And then the Supreme Court has been very clear that expert testimony will always be required to establish that this individual, in fact, suffers from that condition. These are situations that are not easily faked. Crew says in Canada, the sexomnia defense has been used about 15 times. In a third of those cases, the perpetrator was declared not criminally responsible. That's an outcome the woman doesn't want to think about. Since being raped, she's fought through alcohol and drug abuse, thoughts of suicide. She's now married and working. She considers herself a survivor, not a victim, but she's worried about a setback. You can't prepare yourself for that. You just, you can't. And like I've asked myself a million times, what what if the outcome isn't what I think it should be? What, how will I react? You know, how will I move on? How will I get past it? After seven years, two trials and two appeals, a Brockville judge will deliver a final verdict on Monday. For the woman, it will result in legal closure, but it may not bring any comfort. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Tried three times, it still didn't work. Pulled the card out, I was frustrated. Looked at the card and it was uh, my bank's card. Looked the same as mine, but I looked at the back and it was someone else's signature. Some Toronto taxi drivers are running a scam. Yeah, switching cards on unsuspecting clients. Details up ahead.
Thinking ahead to the weekend, and I'm wondering if people should be planning on like bundling up and staying indoors, nice warm blanket, and lots of snacks. Because <laughs> it sounds like some weather's coming. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, again, I feel like every weekend we have had a storm, literally in the past month, mm -hmm. and uh, that's exactly what's going to happen again. Right. Um, yeah starting Friday night into Saturday. So if we take a look at the timeline, we're going to see that snow start in the evening on Friday for the southwest and then it will continue to spread towards the Avalon and then north as we head through the evening on Friday. Now Saturday morning is when we'll start to see that change over to rain for uh, parts of the Buren and the Avalon into the afternoon and then uh, a warm up is on the way. So we're going to see that continue uh, through the day on Saturday with some more rain. And behind that on Sunday, it does look like things will kind of clear out, but we'll still see some lingering flurry activity for the most part. So here's a look at the forecast for Saturday. Temperatures uh, not really moving much for the West Coast. We're going to see below zero temperatures right through Saturday. Uh, Port of Basque is going to be warm, though, sitting around three degrees or at least above zero. And then that's the case for Buren and the Avalon. As you can see, that load just sitting offshore. Uh, things will change over to rain through the day. So taking a look a little bit ahead, we're going to see that snow continue at least for the West Coast on Sunday for parts of the Southern uh, Avalon or rather Southern Buren is going to see that rain continue, at least shower activity, a little bit of a break on Monday. We'll see that high pressure move in again. And then Tuesday, another system moves in, starting as snow, changing back over to rain. Uh, and this one looks like it'll be warm for the Avalon and uh, the Buren. So we'll see most of that just as, as rain altogether. It probably won't change over to snow. And then uh, looking even a little bit further ahead, I'm going to hang on to these colder temperatures. So it does look like snow is in the forecast. So taking a look over the next five days, we're going to see the winds pick up Friday night, continue into Saturday with this system. But again, look, six, de six degrees is the afternoon high. Then it'll drop back down to around zero or one degree uh, through next week. So flurries will be the story Monday night and into Tuesday as well for eastern parts of Newfoundland and St. John's. Now, not going to see that warm up though through western Newfoundland. We're going to continue to hang on to these cooler temperatures uh, dropping down to about minus one, minus two through the afternoon and about some snow on the way for Saturday. Sunday, again, some more snow and some squalls uh, as we uh, see that onshore flow Monday and Tuesday look like uh, we'll continue to see that flurry activity. Central Newfoundland, same thing, but sun should peak out on Sunday, Monday, return of those flurries, and then temperatures dipping down Saturday night down to about minus nine through the day. Now for Labrador tomorrow, five degrees, or rather five centimeters on the way Friday night into Saturday with some flurries. Sunday looks nice, but those temperatures are going to be cold again, minus 13 uh, for Sunday and then continuing into the afternoon. And then same thing for Eastern Labrador, at least through the overnight with that snow and generally flurries hanging around into next week. Thanks, Ashley. Well, if you're traveling to Toronto anytime soon, we have a scam to warn you about. It involves deceptive cab drivers and fake debit machines. Two victims say thousands of dollars were drained from their bank accounts, and one says he has the hardware to prove it. Chris Glover reports. At the top, it indicated Toronto Taxi. There's no such taxi company uh, in Toronto. Ryan O'Connor looks over a receipt he got from his cab driver. Turns out this was a fake. The $8 fee never charged to his debit card. He didn't know it until the next day he tried to buy a coffee. Tried three times, it still didn't work. Pulled the card out, it was frustrated. Looked at the card and it was uh, my bank's card. Looked the same as mine. But I looked at the back and it was someone else's signature. O'Connor's bank told him it was someone else's already defrauded card. The taxi driver allegedly switched the cards and somehow recorded his PIN. Then 200 and then uh, four transactions at a, at a grocery store. The driver allegedly racked up $4,100 of fraudulent purchases, money it took about two weeks for the bank to return. It's almost as violating as someone knocking down your door and stealing your stereo or your, or your laptop. Crown Taxi told him they would pull GPS records to try to find out who the driver was. They also promised to cooperate with the police investigation, but we've found out this is hardly a one-off case. And then any pin you put in, it will say approved no matter what. 
uh, no matter what pin you put in, and the pin saves into his computer. Gio Manuel, another alleged victim of the debit swap taxi scam, thinks he's put it all together. But the first time, he told me he had no change to break my $20 bill. In April, a cabbie forced him to pay debit. Days later, he realized his card had been swapped and $3,500 drained from his account. Then last month, a different cabbie refused a big cash tip in favor of debit. He became suspicious and wanted to keep the machine to give to police. He turned around and tried to snatch the, the machine out of my hand. And as he did that, I pulled away and jumped out of the cab and ran down the street and he skidded his tires. He says police didn't take the machine and he is critical of the investigation. I told him what bank he withdrew money from, what time it happened, all that information was given to them and nothing. What do you think of that? I think it's insane. Part of me wants it to happen again so that I can see second time I was a little less prepared. I got the machine third time. The guy's not getting away. Like I, I need to catch him. <laughs> He was also critical of the cab companies. Toronto police say that this scam has been going on since at least 2015, and Manuel said the cab company should be doing a better job of preventing it from happening. We reached out to Crown Taxi, but they didn't return our calls. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Well, these are looking all too familiar across the province uh, today. Mm -hmm. Any idea where that photo was taken? Well, Newfoundland has 17,500 kilometers of coastline. You're right. <laughs> it's good you know that right off the top of your so head. So I yeah, do you, yeah, don't was... know, but man, look at that. Yeah, it's, wow. It's on the Avalon, but I wonder if this is great for surfers. I think Very it's, brave it's, ones. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's a little cold, don't you think? Yep. True. But yeah, I'll tell you where this photo is taken coming up after the break. Yeah, so uh, we're we gonna start right with sure. the weather. Why not? weather windy yeah. picture. There's the windy picture from today. The Avalon, huh? Yeah, Avalon. Just about that building up there on the cliff. Any idea, Carolyn? It's like South Coast. We didn't no, see that. Sure. Southern, yeah. Like Southern Avalon. Mm-hmm. Like Whitless Bay. No. No, you got us. Portugal. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I always get you guys. Oh, it's oh, not Avalon. Oh, forgot. right. The Avalon. <laughs> that Avalon. Trick question. <laughs> tricky, tricky. <laughs> oh, I'm good at that, hey? Yep. Yeah, there's the stormy seas near Fortune. Thank you, Murdoch Hitchcock, for sending that in. If yes. you have any weather photos you'd like to send to them, send them to yeah. nlphotos. At Murdoch CBC. must have CA. spat his tea out when you told him this was the Avalon. I know. <laughs> great shot, though, Murdoch. Yeah, great great shot. Awesome. <laughs>
Yeah. That's it for us. It is. We'll see you tomorrow. Good, Good night. night.